there is a process of colonization. And when I say process of colonization, you have to understand that this is not first colonization. This isn't a process that we used when we were Spain and we were just trying to grab big chunks of land. This is colonization under mercantilism. And so we're looking at, at best, 1750s, but really it doesn't come into fruition until the 1800s. We start exploration 1500, but 1500 and 1600s is really exploring and trying to claim land in a much more feudal style. By 1750s, 1800s, we have shifted, and it's about ports. It's about trading. It's a business model. We want to have our raw materials. With this shift, we have a different process of colonization. And I might argue, unintentional. Because in a perfect world, you always have ports, and you only have ports. It's a perfect world. If you are uh, McDonald's, do you want to spend money putting a security guard in every one of your stores? Can you imagine how much money that is? Shockingly high. It's much better if you don't have to, if you just let the local police take care of security. Okay? But sometimes you have to. That's this one. So here's the process. Number one. Local relationships. And I use this word deliberately. This is not, in your textbook, sometimes I don't, I don't know. I think because it's such a dialectical narrative, they don't, they don't emphasize the concept of a relationship. They usually think Europeans come in and say, hey, we're better than all you guys, plus we're racist, and we're men, we're sexist too, we're going to just take all of you guys as slaves. It's so unrealistic. Can someone just tell me, like, in plain language, why that's unrealistic? Because you have never had to use that in the past. Okay, let's put it in real terms. I'm going in the middle of Africa. I'm Dr. Livingston. <laughs> I'm the only white guy here, and I come in and I say, Yep, uh, all you guys are not my slaves. <laughs> How, how's that going to go? <laughs> You're dead. Okay. You, you are not the majority. The whole point is you are establishing a relationship because you are not the majority. You are a distinct minority. You might have a gun, but does that really help you if there's 800 of these guys? No, it doesn't. So it, you genuinely establish relationships. And this isn't new. What did the French do really early on? And they weren't doing this because they were being um, humanitarian. French were doing this really in the middle of Louis XIV, Louis XV. They didn't have any sense of constitutional due process in quite the same way. They went off to the Indians because that's how you got the furs. That's how you traded with them. You, you, didn't, you weren't out there to set up a government. You just simply get the furs. And that's what this, middle, this mercantilism might do. You establish a relationship. As soon as you do this, two things happen. What do the Europeans have? Always. That they can give. That they have an advantage over the guy that they're visiting. Technology? Yes. Okay. I, I shouldn't have said it that way. I, um, I go to Maria. I want uh, Maria's backpack. I really like Maria's backpack. I want her backpack. Okay, in order for me to get her backpack, I could beat her over the head, give her a kick, and steal her backpack. But what's going to happen? What are you guys all going to do if I pick on poor Maria? I'm dead. You guys kill me. Okay. Exaggeration. With what? Okay. So, what's the other option? I say, hey, Maria, I really like your backpack. What can I do? Establishing relationship. That's what I want, but I have to give. What do the Europeans have? that the, the locals want what technologies, right? But what kind of technologies? They have guns. They have basic technologies, right? So glass, always big. Why is glass always big? It's not a big, important technology, but it is. <laughs> it's a big deal. If you're off in your hunter-gatherer, or you're a nomad, or you're off a tribal, you know glass. Glass is a big deal. Is it expensive for the Europeans? Super easy. Where are the raw materials for glass? Do you guys know this? Sand. Sand. Okay, it's everywhere. Not expensive. We give you some glass. Um, people are fighting you all the time. What also might we give you? Weapons. Weapons. Now, 
Are we careful about this? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We're not going to give you the top line. Why don't we give you the top line weapons? This is super easy. So they can have them. So they can all the power. Yeah, I mean, I'm a minority as it is, right? I don't want you to be able to kill me, but I'll give you some minimal ones. Things that are not as advanced as mine, but they're more advanced than what your neighbors have. This is where, no matter where you are in the world, that almost always sells. And so we've got technology. And then what do we get in response? What do the natives want? I mean, excuse me, uh, what do the natives offer? And this is really important to understand because I think a lot of people get confused. And it has to do with that old exploration thing. Everyone's talking about gold, like they want gold. How much gold do the natives like, generally have? None, okay? The, the king might have some gold that's been inherited down generation. It's gone, it's gone, there's nothing more. It's not gold, we're not talking about intrinsic goods. This is the shift in mercantilism from 1750s to 1500s. Even the French didn't quite get this. They went out and they wanted furs. Furs are intrinsically valuable. Mercantilism doesn't have to have furs. Because if you're only going out with furs, what happens after a while? You kill all the you, people. You, the furs are gone. And then where's your value? Mercantilism is looking at really raw materials. Wood. Wood is not valuable if you're an Indian. Okay? No value at all. Because what is it? It's all around you. But you take the wood, you ship it back to England, you mill it, you turn it into lumber, and you turn it into beautiful cabinets. You bring those back and you show that to the Indian. That they love, right? Because they don't see it that way. That's something different. The wood, not valuable. The whole concept is you get the raw material, dirt, cheap. Then you finish it. So two things that they offer. They're going to offer some type of raw material. But more importantly, they're going to offer the port. And what we look for is a concept. When I say we, we're talking a, a European series. It's called extra territoriality. Does anybody know what this means? If you don't, I'll give you a hint. Extra territoriality. Go ahead. This is kind of where the port that they get is under their control. Yeah. It's, it's, think of an, an, an embassy. Embassies are all extra territoriality. If they had a French embassy in Richmond Center, which they wouldn't, but if they did, that actually would be French property, the size and the scope of the building, but it's French property. Our uh, police would not be able to go in there because it's, it's not American, it's French property. One of the agreements we give when we do an embassy is that that's your property. Extraterritoriality. That's what the Europeans want, especially England. England is best at this. Just give me the port, and if you give me the port, whether it's inside or outside, it doesn't have to be a Navy port, wherever it is, I want extraterritoriality there. That's our stuff. Our police, our focus. And if you think about it from a trading perspective, it's our warehouse. Okay? I'm not paying some local to protect our goods. It's the British that are going to be there to protect. So we have local relationship, and then we have this exchange. Well, you guys all understand this concept of cultural diffusion. What inevitably happens? Is cultural, first of all, is cultural diffusion avoidable? No. Absolutely not. It's totally inevitable. Even if you don't want it, it's going to happen. So what you have is reactions. So trade produces cultural diffusion, which is going to affect your cultural identity, which is going to have reactions and expansion. The reaction number one. So you are dealing with tribe number A. And because you're dealing with him, he's becoming very powerful. What about tribe number A's friends on the borders? They are now less powerful. Do they like tribal A now? They like them all less. And they're afraid of them. So what does tribal B, C, D, and E want to do? As best as possible, they're going to steal some of the weapons that you gave to tribal A. And then they're going to have big wives. Well, what is Tribal A now going to be asking you for? More weapons, more powerful weapons. And there's always a deal here. And what's happening is that you're here, 
you're on the port. This is my port, and all I want is this port. And this is the guy that I have a relationship with. But these are all the people outside. And, and they're being influenced by your influence of them. So they're getting some of those weapons. And because they have some of those weapons, maybe they're fighting more than they did before. And so how do you, how do you stop that? Another term here, pacification. It's a wonderful word, and if you look at it, you can kind of, you can figure it out even if you've never heard it before. Pacification. What is a pacifist? Oh. These guys like peace, right? Just peace, pacifist. Pacification. Peacification. But you guys also are smart enough to realize that <laughs> If you want peace, what would you usually have to use? In war, okay. And so pacification means these guys are all fighting. Well, okay. I'm sorry, guys, but you guys are not able to control this. We are now expanding our extraterritoriality to include you, and we'll deal directly with these people, and we'll put them in some order, right? That'll be fine for a little bit because you're right there. Except, you know. Um, there's other people that are on their order. And slowly, your pacification means that over time, in order for you to maintain the peace, you have to expand your footprint. Do you want to expand the footprint? No. But once you do, what happens to trade? What happens to the order, the police? The, the ability to, to move your car, our cargo from this for a side of the port to that side. So much more order. It's peaceful. So you don't want to, but when you do, there is an advantage. You don't want to. You'd rather they take care of it themselves. That's the reactions. You've got <coughs> expansions. Eventually, if you take this to its extreme, what does that mean? It means not just one port, right? It means that you've got everything. We're going to see this in India. And we started off, what was the event that triggered greater English influence in India? The revolt. Because it was just, it was chaos and there was no order. And so England just took it over. They ended company control and they put in crown rule. Then the company can operate with peace. Does that make sense? India is different though. When we look at the Middle East, it doesn't fit that way. Why doesn't it fit in part the same way? We'll talk about this later, but what's one thing that India has going for it? Yeah, yeah. We'll go back to China. Around the second century BC, what came into China? It didn't revolutionize China then, but by 1100 AD, 1300 years, it absolutely changed their culture. But it comes in around the second century. What is this? What am I talking about? Buddhism. Buddhism. That's right. Well, where did it come from? India. India's got a very long history, very rich cultural identity. It's not politically unified. We're going to talk about this. It's not a swing and back and forth, but it has periods where it's kind of united, and it just has periods where it's not. You're going to see uh, Hindus are dominant, but you're also going to see Muslims in big parts, right? The Taj Mahal, guy's Muslim. Now, it's later, but you, you have Muslim folks, you have Hindu folks. You, you don't really have a lot of Buddhist folks left because it doesn't fit into the caste system. But their social system is shockingly stable. And part of it has to do with the castes. It's not a political stability where you have one country, but social stability very strong. What don't you have in Middle East? Social stability. Really? What's the length of their cultural identity? <coughs> How long? How old is that? We go back to India. It's, it's about 1200 BC, right? Where is the Middle East? When do they get their about first really cultural? About 650, right? It's not that old. And right off the bat, 
as soon as Muhammad dies, what do they go into? Divisions. Not just divisions political, but really the political divisions are reflecting these also religious divisions. The Shia and the Sunni, they never, today they're not united. So that makes for a different field of operation. Some are more receptive to westernization, others are not. I've got three minutes here. Let me see if I can give you some examples. Egypt, the Ottomans. Egypt, long history. But the people living in Egypt in 1800, are they any connection whatsoever to the people that built the pyramids? Probably not. Zero. Long time ago, zero. The Romans took over, then after the Romans took over, the, um, uh, the, the Christians had dominance there for a very long time. And then when Muhammad came over, they swept over, literally, physically swept over. And, and they're just not the same people, literally not the same people. Okay, but Egypt does have an importance. Why did Egypt start 3500 BC? What did Egypt have that this region really relies on? Water, the Nile. What also does this region have that mercantilism really, really is interested in? Do they have cotton? No. Sugarcane. What do they have? Oh, canal. The Suez Canal. And why is that a big deal? Because it cuts off a shocking amount of time. You don't have to go around Africa. This becomes a hot spot. So, People come in there very early. France goes in there. Napoleon goes to Egypt before he takes over the rest of Europe. It's because of the, it's, it's a region. There's no other reason. There's nothing else here. Now, what about the Ottoman Empire? They've been there since 1453. They've been pushing into Europe forever. When the Western Empire, the Byzantine Empire died, they took over. They, they're westernized, but they're not. They've got urban cities. They're not deserts. So they're naturally westernized with certain western technology, but they're still a little bit behind. And then all these spots in between. So here we have Jamal al-Din Afghani. He is famous for coming up with these ideas that try to merge Islam with the West. These guys are the ones that are responsible for getting rid of the concept of jihad and dead man walking. And this idea that the state has to absolutely be a religious. But look at the dates of these people. This is 20th century. Why do these people even come about? What has happened for these people to come up with their ideas? Europe, totally industrialization, spreading in, not necessarily destroying or fighting with the Ottomans, although there are lots of wars here, Crimea War being a perfect example, but also trade. These guys are becoming westernized, and so the Islamic thinkers are kind of westernizing their theology. This is where you see the most kind of modern western sides of Islam. Well, who's not here? These guys aren't here. Do they have the same westernization? Yeah. No. Last little bit. We, we keep pointing to 1914 right before World War I, and I'll just give you the hint. World War I is a war of empires. So what's happening in the 1800s to bring World War I about? Building the empires, not just the British. France is going to go into Africa. Lots of French, that's where most of their empires are. Germany is going to have some things in Africa, but they don't become a state until 1871, so a little late. Italy doesn't become a state until 1860, but they also have uh, uh, handholds in Africa. England is the really the only one that's really strong across the country. The Dutch have places over there. Spanish had, but they're losing them. You're building empires. In World War I, do you remember the famous Spanish army in World War I? No, because they're not an empire. <coughs> What do we want you to think about? Next class, <coughs> today's Wednesday, right? Monday, India. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply the exact same process 
And uh, Middle East is, is unique because it's so fragmented. And India is not politically united, but their social system, the caste, is much more consistent. So we're going to see this in very specific terms in India. Questions? And I want you guys to read about India. Questions, comments, words of wisdom?